Hey everybody, welcome. Welcome to today's Law of Self-Defense show where we will be talking about defending yourself against animal attack. And I have a couple of videos of animal attack to share with you as well as, of course, the actually relevant legal principles that would govern such a thing. It's not quite the same as self-defense for reasons we'll talk about. And we have, again, as a very special guest, always welcome here, attorney Steve Gosney. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for being here again today. Good to have you. Thank you. Good to, good to be on. Always fun to be on the uh, with your chatters and your channel. And for folks who may not know, Steve is with the Public Defender's Office in Florida. Which which district is or circuit is that, Steve? Well, it's the 5th District, so fifth. it's a 13-county district. I'm in Daytona Beach, but we cover Orlando and Melbourne, St. Augustine, kind of a big block of Central Florida. And uh, Steve works primarily in the uh, appellate division right now, but still does a lot of training for the trial division where he also has had extensive experience and not just on the defense side, but also what, six years as a prosecutor down in Florida. Right. Six um, years I... in private practice as a civil litigator, six years in prosecution, a uh, bunch of trials. I'm going to be training the trial division tomorrow. Actually, we have a part two of, of doing a misdemeanor trial division training. And I hear we're going to have a little training with uh, law of self-defense community. Is that correct? I blanked out there for a second. Uh, <laughs> are we going to have a training in the law of self-defense world? Uh, are we talking about the criminal law class? Yeah, yeah. I'm pulling that up right now. There we go. Yes, of course. We're starting at tomorrow starts the launch of our American law courses with our criminal law course. And the criminal law course is being taught by none other than attorney Steve Gosney right here. Uh, we're starting a whole series of the equivalent of first year law school courses. We're launching with this criminal law course starts tomorrow, taught over the course of a semester, just like it would be in law school. So we're teaching traditional American criminal law in the traditional American way without all the crazy uh, progressive leftist politics that pervades law schools today and at a fraction of the time and cost of law school. And we're very honored to have as experienced a criminal attorney uh, as Steve, um, who's, who's uh, presented himself to teach this course for us. And uh, we're, we're honored to have him. Uh, folks, I, one thing I need to make clear, the class starts tomorrow, tomorrow evening. That's September 7th, 2022. And up through... The start of that class, meaning the next, what, uh, 26 or 28 hours or so, the tuition for the course is half price. Half price. That saves you hundreds of dollars in, in registering for this course, but only over the course of the next day or so. So if learning criminal law, of being a genuine, knowledgeable American patriot in the laws that control your destiny, the destiny of your family, your liberty, if that matters to you, and it darn well ought to, if you would like that expert level education in criminal law, now's the opportunity, folks. It's never been easier or less expensive for you to get that at American Law Courses. And you can learn more about all this and register. I would urge you to register at lawofselfdefense.com slash law courses. And that is the sponsor of today's show lawofselfdefense.com slash law courses. And I'll be uh, contributing and or teaching a couple of the classes in that criminal law course myself, uh, particularly when we come to the uh, use of force justification portion. Right. And also, um, I was actually, we were talking a little bit offline. Um, also, when we have the, uh, the portion on the Fifth Amendment, there's going to be a whole module on Miranda and the Fifth Amendment and the right to remain silent. And... Um, so we're going to go really in depth on that, probably more in depth than you will ever find. Even most lawyers get trained because um, that's an area that I have very well explicated. And so um, but I know that you have some comments on special self-defense scenarios and when right. you know when you might want to break the cardinal rule or the golden rule of do not talk to the police. I want a lawyer. I want to remain silent. Yeah. And there's some special circumstance. So you're going to, I'm going to tap you in and comment, you know, bring you in when the, uh, the occasion arises that, and of course, you're also going to be my resident expert, the resident expert for the United States on the law of self-defense. But before that, we're going to cover all the, um, the, the law of self of 
basically murder, aggravated battery, and death penalty. And then we're going to go into defenses. And of course, you're going to be up on that one too. So um, I am definitely going to tap into the expertise that we have of the dean of the law school um, when appropriate. <laughs> I guess I should get a new name tag, huh? Dean, Dean Andrew Branca. Uh, by the way, I heard today from a, a lawyer, a friend of mine, who's actually signing up for the course. So it's not just for lay people. He's, uh, he's an attorney who's, uh, of course, took criminal law as a first year course in law school, but never really did criminal law in practice. And he's looking to refresh his recollection and uh, finds this to be a unique opportunity to do that. So it's not just for lay people, folks, and it's not just for first timers. No, and this uh, is going to be expert level stuff. And I've also targeted it to stuff. It's great because it's not we're not going to have to cram in a maximum amount of stuff. We're actually going to cover stuff really in depth. We're going to look at things very um, carefully, methodically, and it's going to not be covered up with a lot of uh, confusion like they like to do in law school or political correctness like they do in law school. It's going to be substantive. Um, so it, even though it will be anybody is it's open to anybody, it is expert level stuff. So um, and I, I, I try to speak as clearly as possible and Obviously, I'll be available to interact and we'll answer questions during the interaction. So if you have problems, it's uh, understanding the material. There'll be feedback breaks. Um, so it's going to work. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm actually on preparing for it. I'm, I'm just going back and refreshing my own recollection on a lot of these issues. So it helps me and it's going to be a, a lot of fun. Yeah. And for folks who don't know, this is being taught live. So it's being streamed live every class using um, a webinar type platform. Uh, and there's be plenty of opportunity for Q&A. So this is, um, you know, as close to going to law school as you can get without having to incur the cost and, you know, three you years. You don't have to go, actually don't have to pay the ridiculous tuition. You don't have to. Um, the, the, it's online. So you can be in your comfort of your own home or office. It has you can restream it. So um, if you miss one, you can go back. And uh, so it's it's you don't have to take the LSAT. You don't have to commit to quitting your job and becoming a lawyer. You <laughs> Heaven can forbid. <laughs> if, you know, if you're interested and you really love, because a lot of people, you know, used to be back in the day before television, people used to go to the courthouse and watch trials. And uh, so this gives you some, some, I mean, if you're just interested in the law and criminal law, because I know that when you're covering stuff online or Nick Ricada or, or a lot of the cases that people, they look and they watch these cases, a lot of them are criminal. Yeah. And so this will give you a real tool set to when, when you're the lawyers discussing things, you'll know stuff that like most people don't know. You'll say, right. Oh, I know what he's talking about here. You'll be the so guy in the room fun. or the gal in the room who actually knows what's going on. Right. Okay. So let's get to, um, Oh, of course the usual, uh, YouTube stuff, folks, God knows how long I'll be on YouTube. It's uh, I hear Nick's got another suspension. Uh, this is, I mean, they keep labeling my content as, you know, 18 and older and putting other kinds of warnings on it. It's uh, it's a crazy, crazy place. But as long as we're here, um, if you could hit the subscribe button, that's very helpful. Uh, ring the bell. Maybe you'll get a notification. Who knows? Uh, leave a comment, even if it's only your city and state or something offensive about YouTube. That's fine with me. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, but it helps uh, fool the YouTube algorithm into uh, measuring more engagement which I guess is a thing. And if you could hit that like thumbs up button, that's also very helpful. All right, so today uh, we had a couple of videos over the last few days about animal attacks and people defending themselves against animal attacks. Uh, these both happen to be wild animals, but what we'll talk about would apply to, you know, supposedly domesticated animals as well. You'd like to think domesticated animals wouldn't attack people, but there you go. Um, and it's an, an interesting area of the law because we think of, you know, the phrase self-defense means different things in different contexts. And of course, we all have a generalized sense of self-defense, right? You can defend yourself against a criminal's attack. You can defend yourself against an animal attack. You can defend yourself against volatility in the stock market by doing different things. I mean, there's a lot of contexts in which we might apply the phrase self-defense. But in the legal context, in terms of justifying a use of force, we really need to distinguish in a technical way between when you're defending yourself against another human being using force against another human being versus using force against an animal, because the law looks at those in two very different ways. Um, the law, as you might expect, 
values human life at a much higher level than it does animal life. It doesn't mean you can kill animals willy-nilly. We have laws against that too. But the legal standards and thresholds and the burdens of proof uh, that have to be met to justify a use of force are distinguished between when you're using force against another person and when you're using force against an animal. So what I'd like to do is, uh, first I'll start with these couple of videos. They're both pretty short. One of them involves a gentleman on a, a snowmobile who encounters an angry moose, looks like a moose. Uh, not the biggest moose I've ever seen. Uh, I've been on uh, motorcycle trips up in New England, up in Maine, where you see moose on the side of the road that look like they're the size of large cargo vans. Uh, this moose wasn't that big, fortunately for the guy in the uh, the snowmobile. Uh, but it does charge the man in the snowmobile who retrieves a pistol and uh, fires a bunch of shots at the moose uh, and then races off on a snowmobile. And the second one is from Italy. It involves, it looks like a hunter with a shotgun. Um, apparently, uh, under this circumstance in Italy, they're only allowed to have three rounds in the shotgun. And three rounds was not enough when this hunter was charged by a wild boar. And things get very exciting. There's a lot of Italian spoken, a lot of very excited Italian. I grew up in an Italian household, uh, so we're prone to speaking in an excited tone of voice anyway. Uh, this person gets really excited. Uh, I have no idea what they're saying, but it sounds like fun. It's all Italian. Maybe they're ordering pasta for all I know. But here we go. Let me grab the first of those, and uh, I'll play them at the start. Then we'll talk about the law, and then I'll play them again at the end so we can review them. Uh, in the context of the law. Let's see. Where did I put those? One second, folks. One second. Here we go. All right. Here's the moose shooting. Pull that up. And here we go. Snowmobile. Moose. That's the uh, the driver of the snowmobile, I guess, trying to make noises to uh, frighten away the moose, who's unimpressed, to say the least. Whoa, 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 And out comes the gun. I guess you had to cycle the slide. Oh, oh that's a bad day for the moose. <laughs> Poor moose. And the guy in the snowmobile rides away. He's got a. He's going to look over his shoulder now. We'll see. He a, a buddy behind him. There's his buddy. That's the end of the moose video. Again, we'll play this again in just a moment. And now let me pull up the wild boar video out of Italy. That one is... <laughs> Moose lives matter. <laughs> Here's the wild boar. Lots of angry Italian here. Oh, <laughs> All right, I let that run long just to hear the Italian. <laughs> did they? Did she hit him with that uh, shotgun? I didn't. I see don't it. know. Uh, boar are very, very tough creatures. It looked to me just from the video, but it's hard to tell from the angle. Uh, well, uh, there's more than two rounds allowed, folks, because she fired three. So I believe there's three rounds allowed. But pretty obviously, she she didn't have four, or she still would have been shooting. Uh, it looked to me like she clearly shot uh, well above it. This the second, the third shot looked like an accidental discharge to me. Like she wasn't aligned on the target at all. She just panicked. Um, but in any case, that could have gone far, far worse uh, than it did. So let's talk about these two different legal defenses: uh, self-defense and what I'll call the defense of necessity, the necessity defense. It comes under a variety of names. It's a very old doctrine of law. Sometimes it's called choice of evils. Sometimes it's called competing harms. Sometimes it's called the doctrine of lesser harms. When we talk about self-defense as a technical legal defense, self-defense as a legal defense really applies to your use of force 
against another person. You're being attacked by a human being. You're using force to defend yourself against that human being. And there the legal defense uh, is constructed of these five elements of self-defense we talk about all the time, up to five elements, innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. And when you've raised that legal defense of self-defense, the burden of persuasion is then placed on the state to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt, which is really the biggest thing we have going for us as a defendant in a self-defense case is that very high uh, burden of proof, burden of persuasion that's put on the prosecution, assuming, of course, that you've more or less compelled the jury to adhere to that burden of proof. Otherwise, uh, they tend to default to kind of a preponderance of the evidence um, sense of the burden of proof, juries being juries. But <clears throat> if you do it right and uh, make sure they understand and they commit to holding themselves to that very high burden of persuasion being on the state beyond a reasonable doubt, that's a, that's a powerful part of your self-defense claim when you're talking about use of force against another human being. It does not generally apply to the use of force against an animal. In fact, most of the self-defense statutes you'll read will explicitly say words to the effect of the use of force against another person is justified when, and then they'll step through the conditions to justify the use of force, those five elements. When we're talking about the use of force against a non-person, against an animal, we're generally talking about not self-defense as a technical legal defense, but the technical legal defense then becomes the doctrine of necessity. And I have a few necessity doctrine statutes here to pull up to share with you, just so you can see what they look like. Every state has some version of this. It's very, very common. Uh, this was law before most of our statutes were codified. Uh, in some states, you may not find a necessity defense statute, but it would be in the common law defenses for that state, the case law, the court-made law defenses. But here's uh, Arizona's necessity defense statute. And basically what all of these say is that if you committed an act that would normally be unlawful, but you committed a small harm to avoid a lesser, uh, a larger harm, that that's excusable or that's justified conduct. So you did something that would normally be wrong, but you did it to avoid a greater harm. That's the necessity we're talking about. And typically there's also the condition that you, you did not create the necessity to commit the, even the lesser harm, that this was not your fault. You didn't create the circumstances. But here's the Arizona version. It says conduct that would otherwise constitute an offense, a criminal offense, is justified if a reasonable person was compelled to engage in that conduct and you had no reasonable alternative to avoid imminent public or private injury greater than the injury that might reasonably result from the person's own conduct. So an, an example of this might be you're walking down the sidewalk on a really hot day. You walk by a car that's locked, the windows are rolled up, and you see there's a baby in the back seat in the baby seat. And you know it's hot enough outside. It's going to be way hotter inside that locked car. That baby's going to die if it's left in that car. You break the car window to unlock the door and get the baby out of the car so it doesn't die from the heat inside the vehicle. You broke the window of someone else's car. That's normally unlawful conduct. You're not just allowed to do that, but your justification would be this necessity defense. Sure, I committed a harm, but it's a small harm compared to the harm that was avoided by my conduct. Uh, the saving of the life is a greater value than uh, the loss of the breaking of the window of the car, and therefore my conduct ought to be justified. Uh, now, in this particular case, um, Again, as I mentioned, generally speaking, you also cannot have created the need. So if you're the person who locked the baby in the car, I mean, it wouldn't even make sense then, but you understand the point. If you create the necessity, you can't then justify the bad conduct from uh, circumstances that you yourself created. Here it reads, an accused person may not assert this defense, necessity defense, if the person intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly placed himself in the situation where it was probable you'd have to engage in the small harm. Uh, and an accused person may not assert the defense for offenses involving homicide or serious physical injury, meaning serious physical injury to others. So if you're trying to justify having killed someone or having caused someone serious physical injury, this is not your defense. 
your defense would then be the technical defense of self-defense with those five elements. So pretty, pretty classic example of a necessity defense. I have a few other states here to pull up to show you quickly, just so you can see how common it is. Um, let's see, New Hampshire conduct, they call it competing harms. Same, same legal doctrine, just a different title. Conduct which you believe to be necessary to avoid harm to himself or another is justifiable if the desirability and urgency of avoiding such harm outweighs, according to the ordinary standards of reasonableness, the harm sought to be prevented by the statute. So you're committing a small offense to avoid a larger harm. Um, now they add this sentence here. This is interesting. A lot of times these statutes, this sentence was added later. The desirability and urgency of such conduct may not rest upon considerations pertaining to the morality and advisability of the supposed greater harm. Uh, the reason they started adding this language to these statutes is a lot of people, especially in the 60s and 70s, started doing things like uh, going over the fences of nuclear power plants because they were anti-nuclear power, or for that matter, blockading um, uh, abortion centers, or things where they had a moral disagreement with something that was happening, and they'd say, well, nuclear power is going, we all saw Three Mile Island, we all saw uh, the China Syndrome movie with Jane Fonda. Uh, we know that nuclear power is going to destroy the planet. So that's the greatest possible harm. Therefore, anything we do contrary to that would be a lesser harm that could be justified under, under the doctrine of necessity uh, to avoid those kinds of legal arguments being made in court. Uh, this language was added to these statutes to make clear we're talking about something that's a palpable, immediate, eminent harm, not something that's a theoretical harm that may, in your own moral view, uh, apply in the future. Uh, and the second sentence here for New Hampshire basically says, if you were reckless or negligent in bringing about the circumstances, you can't use this legal defense. So again, uh, you can't have created the circumstances uh, that create the need for you to create the lesser harm. We have here another one from Washington State. Let's see. Uh, they, again, call it the necessity of defense. Uh, this is probably the clearest rendition. I really like the way they break this down in specific elements here. If this were being taught in law school, this is probably the form that they would teach it in because it captures all the discrete elements quite nicely. Necessity is a defense to a charge of fill in whatever the offense is that you committed. Um, if you reasonably believe the commission of that crime was necessary to avoid or minimize a harm, so you're only doing it to avoid some other harm. Two, the harm sought to be avoided was greater than the harm you're committing. So doctrine of lesser harms. The threatened harm was not brought about by you. So you didn't create the necessity to do this and no reasonable legal alternative existed. So my little scenario with the locked car in theory, if the owner of the car was standing right there with the key fob and could just unlock the car, you would do that first before you started breaking windows. Here's a key factor, though, that diff also differentiates this from self-defense. Uh, in the old days, decades ago, um, we had this phrase, we still have it, called the affirmative defense. And the affirmative defense used to mean the same thing everywhere in the country. Uh, really, it meant two things at the same time. It meant, one, the defendant had the obligation to raise the defense, to meet a burden of production, some minimal threshold of evidence before the defense could be presented to a jury, um, their burden of production, that's called. And second, they had the burden of persuasion. They had to convince the jury of this defense. Self-defense has traditionally been an affirmative defense that had both those conditions. You had the burden of production, you had to show some minimal proof to support self-defense in the first place, and you had to persuade the jury of the truth of that defense, usually by a preponderance of the evidence. The burden of persuasion was on the defendant. Now, over the last hundred years or so, including just within the last two or three years, the last state finally made this change, but every state has now changed self-defense so that the burden of persuasion of self-defense is no longer on the defendant to convince the jury of self-defense. The burden of persuasion is on the prosecution to disprove self-defense 
and not just by a preponderance of the evidence, but beyond a reasonable doubt. Self-defense has, in effect, become a negative element of whatever criminal charge you're facing for your use of force against another person. The state has to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a big change. So 80 years ago or whatever, you claim self-defense, you had to prove it by 51% of the evidence. Now the state has to disprove it by, I'll make up a number, 95% of the evidence, whatever you think beyond a reasonable doubt is. That's a huge change in favor of the defense and, and, and a good change, in my opinion, of course, as you might imagine. When we talk about the necessity defense, the necessity defense has also traditionally been an affirmative defense, meaning you had the burden of production, you had to have some minimal evidence to raise it in the first place, and the burden of persuasion was on the defendant to prove the necessity defense by a preponderance of the evidence. These are very old laws and very old statutes. And in many states, the statute still literally says the burden of persuasion, often they'll say the burden of proof, but they mean the burden of persuasion is on the defense to prove the necessity defense by a preponderance of the evidence. What that means from a practical perspective is if you had shot a person, the state would have to disprove your justification beyond a reasonable doubt. But if you shoot a dog or a wild animal, and now you're raising the necessity defense, the state doesn't have to disprove that. You have to prove the necessity defense by a preponderance of the evidence. Now, the more recent cases I've read on the necessity defense, the courts seem to be saying, well, no, we're going to update to the modern standard. We're going to place the burden on the state here as well. Uh, to disprove the necessity defense as opposed to the defendant having to prove the necessity defense. But you can't count on that until that case law has actually been created. If you just look at the statutory language, like here we see right here, the Washington statute, and this is the 2021 update. All right. So this is current Washington state law. The defendant has the burden of proving this defense by a preponderance of the evidence. So the, the burden on the defense for Defense and necessity is much, much higher than the burden on the defense for self-defense. Self-defense, the state has to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Defense of necessity, you have to prove it by 51%. Now, of course, the criminal charge you're facing is likely to be much reduced in the sense that if you've shot and killed a human, you could be looking at a homicide charge, a murder charge, or a manslaughter charge. If you shot and killed an animal, it's probably some kind of cruelty to animal charge. Unless, of course, it's some kind of endangered animal, protected animal, and then, then the feds are likely to get involved. And that's a bad day, folks, because the feds are effectively presumed that if you've killed an endangered animal, you did it with malice. They just do not accept at face value that this you were somehow attacked by this animal and you had to do it. Uh, they're concerned about people going out into the woods and shooting endangered animals and then just fabricating a claim of necessity to justify that shooting. So they're likely to prosecute you to the best of their ability and make you argue that defense of necessity all the way through a trial uh, prosecution. And that's really, really expensive, especially in federal court. And you may not win, right? Well, actually, um, let me, can I, I've got a couple thoughts here. Sure. I was doing some research as you were um, speaking on, because I've never actually had a necessity case, I don't think. I don't remember a case that this has been a big issue. Most of my stuff is self-defense because we're both humans, right. felonies, like you're saying. Um, however, looking at the statute, the, the jury instruction in this is 3.6K in Florida, which is duress or necessity, and they have six elements. This burden of proof question is a huge question, and this is, I would say, very advanced lawyering that you're talking about here. I would say it's amazing how few criminal lawyers think about this issue about who bears the burden of proof they get surprised by it at trial yeah and or or like some defense attorneys i've seen don't even think about it and think that they don't even question where the burden of proof lies yeah um, i often and, see lawyers get shocked by this at the charging conference so uh the charging conference usually happens at the very end of the trial where you 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 know everybody's rested and now you're going, all right, what are the final version of the jury instructions going to be for the jury last time to make a decision on this? And it's almost like it's the first time some of the lawyers are looking at the actual jury instructions, which right. to and my one mind of the is things insane. I teach, um, 
our trial at lawyers is to look at the jury instructions early. And I'm looking at the Florida jury instructions and it looks to me like there's a, there's a contradiction. And um, this is my appellate lawyer. eye. <laughs> there is a contradiction about who bears the burden of proof in the in the jury instruction it looks like it's mostly case law related it's not statutory and in the one hand it says in order to find the defendant committed the crime charge out of duress you must find these elements so that to me is a burden on the defense side which is the traditional rubric right yep but then later on it says if you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant committed the crime charge out of duress you should find the defendant not guilty so that to me the burden is on the state and now this is what happens in, and sadly in florida the prosecutors are all loaded up on the jury criminal jury instructions uh writing committee and they write the, and they write these jury instructions without the benefit of defense attorneys i've applied to be on that committee several times and keep getting denied because i'm just this defense attorney but then you get sloppy language because they don't see these problems within the statutes and a good defense attorney can bring this up and say, Hey, I think this, the burden should be on the state. And I'll also refer to why is this important? You know, a lot of people think, well, this is just lawyers arguing how many angels dance on the head of a pin. Right. (laughs) But I've got a whole article about this, about the unresolved burden of proof in Florida regarding the prescription drug defense. Because there is a really a screwy jury instruction involving who bears the burden of proof in a prescription drug defense. So just kind of applying this here, why does it matter? If you have a prescription, you get caught, you got a prescription Oxycontin. And the burden is on you. You can go to, they can take you to trial, say he was in possession of those pills. Then you come in, you say, okay, in the defense case in chief, say, I've got a prescription. The jury can disbelieve you and convict you even if you have a prescription. I mean, that's how screwy it is. So, and, and so there's an, um, one of my articles is written about how screwy, basically when the burden is on the defense, I think it should, and traditionally here, and in fact, on this article, I was just looking back on it. Usually if defendant, if you have, an element of the crime that is negated by the defense, then the burden traditionally is on the state. But if it's something, if you have to add things to the charge, generally the burden is on the defense to, to, to burden of proof is on the defense. And it can make all the difference in the world when you're talking about JOA motions, because you get a, you go to charge and all the state's shown is that you have possession of the prescription. You say, yeah, yeah, but I have a prescription here. Too bad, you're guilty, right? Whereas if the state has to disprove your prescription, then that could get dismissed at the judgment of acquittal stage or at some preliminary stage. So this is this, even though it sounds like we're just talking very esoteric law, this can make all the difference in the world. Like when you have yeah. to prove yourself not guilty, the jury can disbelieve it. It's, uh, and in my opinion, I see very, very few uh, criminal defense lawyers do this effectively. I mean, one case, a famous case where I saw it done really, really well was the George Zimmerman trial where uh, Mark O'Mara and Don West during jury selection. So the jury hasn't even been selected yet. They haven't been impaneled during jury selection. They're talking to the jury about the burden of proof on self-defense and that it's on the state beyond a reasonable doubt. And Mark O'Mara actually, he brings out a chart, a chart that he puts up on an easel. It's like a three foot by four foot chart. And he puts his hand on the chart. He's like, listen, to find my, def- my client guilty, the state has to disprove him not this much guilty or this much guilty or this much guilty or this much, but this much guilty. And he, he just, and that's what the judge will instruct you. And are you willing to adhere to that burden of proof? And of course the, the jury all nods, right? I mean, what else are they going to do? But you've, The key is you've made them emotionally commit to that before they've heard one bit of evidence in the case. So everything they hear over the course of the trial is now filtered through that awareness that all this proof has to add up 
to something beyond a reasonable doubt, disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. If that's not done, the, the normal human tendency is to go with a preponderance of the evidence standard. Do I think they proved it or do I think they not proved it? And that's that's a that's a, a seesaw. That's a 51 percent standard. That and charge, and um, after they've done all that, they've heard all the evidence and they're all the way at the end. And finally, they hear the jury instruction. Sure. The jury instruction at the end of the trial will tell them that the burdens on the state self-defense to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But it's too late by then. Everything's been filtered through this false preponderance expectation uh, up to that point. that's usually the way we make decisions. I mean, you usually you make a decision. Is it better or is it worse? Is it, right. you know, what's the danger? You kind of weigh the consequences, whereas the burden is way out of balance in the criminal law for the protection of innocent people. Um, you talk about that chart. I'm very familiar with that chart. Um, that was actually also used in the Casey Anthony case, if you remember. Okay. Um, and that's uh, Florida. We that's it's kind of a, a hot item around here. We try to get that chart in front of juries because and prosecutors always complain. But it is a fair representation of the burden of proof and how how great beyond the exclusion of every reasonable doubt is and how high that preponderance is. And most people don't make decisions that way. Yeah. And of course, it drives me crazy when prosecutors complain about stuff like that, because it is the legal standard. And the only reason they complain about it is they don't want to actually be held to that legal standard because it's 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 a very high threshold for them to meet. Uh, but, you know, you get the power and authority of the state and you have to meet that standard and <laughs> just proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That's all part of the package. You don't get the power and authority of the state and you get to disprove self-defense by a mere preponderance. That's not what the law is. But of course, they're hoping to. And frankly, in my opinion, a lot of a lot of prosecutors tend to get lazy about this kind of stuff because so many of their cases are I mean, they're prosecuting guilty people for the most part. Uh, they don't have to work that hard. They don't have to get that creative. And they'll just they, then, you know, they don't like their jobs to be any harder than they'd like them to be. Well, and also they're also they get lazy, too, because they're used to winning. They're used to getting their way. And they're used to getting their way by using, and we'll cover this in the law of self-defense courses, <laughs> about they're used to getting their way because they can threaten to upfile and threaten consequences for whatever gets in their way. And I, I was observing. Yeah, talk that. about that some going, more, Steve, because that's that's a real kind of inside baseball thing that, but ha it has such powerful implications for how the, the criminal defense is conducted. Well, and I was mentioning, I was on Nick's Rumble show the other night. And uh, I was mentioning this about how the uh, the judge, the Nick Cruz case down in South Florida is going on the sentencing, the the, the Parkland shooter fellow. Right. And uh, the defense defense team, I will say, I know what the defense team is doing down there. And I know that defense team. And I know kind of the inside baseball of how well Florida trains its public defenders on death penalty sentencing. And the the defense team is running circles around the prosecutor and the judge down there. Now, I'm not saying they're going to get not guilty or they're going to get or they're going to get a, a life sentence out of that. Um, that's an open question. But what happens is what I'm seeing is you have a judge and a prosecutor who are really throwing tantrums and abusing the defense team and scolding everybody. And they're and they're trying all these techniques. But it's because because they're not used to the defense putting forward so many arguments and objecting to everything, which is required in a death case. And so because of that, their response is to get to kind of pound this table and to scold and to do these things. And it's real because they're not used to the defense coming out so hard because there's not like, what are you going to do to my client? Are you going to send them to the death chamber? <laughs> You're already at the maximum consequence. So the defense is doing everything in their power and everything is being argued. And they're, the state and the judge are not used to that. And that's kind of what you're seeing here, because normally they kind of bully their way. And a defense attorney kind of has to weigh, do I want to make a point here? Do I want to object here? Like you're talking about inside baseball. Right. Not all objections should you make. Sometimes you have you have a relationship with the prosecutor. You have a relationship with the judge. And you know it's maybe it's not a winner or it's you want to pick your battles. Where in a death case, you fight everything. And so, um, so I'm just observing that. Well, I don't know what am I observing. <laughs> the, 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 um, the fact is, is that what what am I observing? You 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 tell me. Well, we're, you were we're, you were talking originally about how one of the things the prosecutors will do is if you, you know, you're rigorously defending your client, uh, the prosecutors will often come back and with a sense of, 
Um, all right, well, you're starting to make my job a lot more complicated than I'm used to it being. And therefore, I'm going to upcharge your client. I'm going to add this charge and that charge and this other charge. Right. Less on the legal merits and more on you're inconveniencing me. And I'm going to make you pay a price for having done exactly. that. Whereas you can't really inconvenience the death client any more than he's being inconvenienced. So there's no there's no consequence to arguing vigorously on every point. And you're actually required in a death case to argue every point. Well, now on back on the animal case, the moose case kind of, I mean, I think that the pig case is pretty easy. But the, the moose case, what do you think about the merits of the necessity defense on the moose case? Well, to my mind, the question would be, uh, could he have avoided need to do that, right? I mean, that's really the key to necessity. He's not obliged. He doesn't have a legal duty to allow himself to be stomped by a moose, right? So he, he doesn't have to take the hoof to the face, which is what was happening. Uh, so that that's a real threat, right? No one wants to get kicked with a hoof in the face by a large animal. And that was not large for a moose, but it, it was large enough uh, to cause serious physical injury. You're not, you don't have any legal duty to submit yourself to the beating of a moose, uh, but if you could, in theory, have just driven your snowmobile around it, uh, then I think that would be a reasonable thing to do. It's kind of hard to tell from the video, though, if they were, you know, sometimes in these woods you're on a track and it's not that easy to get around the track. I've actually never ridden a snowmobile, so I don't know what would be involved in something like that. But I've certainly seen cases where people were hiking on trails that had, you know, steep drop offs on either side. They were attacked by dogs and they, they didn't have a real option to step off the trail one way or the other. They were kind of stuck where they were. I don't know if that was the situation here. If there was an option to, you know, not have to shoot the moose consistent with safety, I think you'd be obliged to do that because there's no necessity then to shoot the moose. Uh, if that's not realistic or a reasonable person would believe, hey, even if I try to get around the side of the moose, he's just going to charge me from the side and knock me off the snowmobile and stomp me. Uh, you know, that's the judgment call that's going to be made. Ultimately, of course, the controlling judgment call is the judgment of the jury, not the right. person on the snowmobile. Well, and um, see, I think that like that moose case, I think could be chargeable. And it depends on your prosecutor. Well, this is where that human factor gets in. And obviously, you look at all oh, the poor moose got shot. Now, you look at it through a self-defense lens. And with, this is the way we think. We think about animals. We humanize them, right? And that animal had attacked, but then disengaged. Right. So at the point he pulled the gun out, the animal didn't charge him a second time. It looked to me like the animal was just in the roadway and he could have gone back or stayed. And so I think a prosecutor could have could possibly charge that. Now, I'm not saying that that's what should be done, but especially since we have people love animals and the poor little moose had, was already walking off. And if you think about it from a self-defense, it's like if, if that was a human being. And the human being had charged you and attacked you and then had disengaged and moved off to then pull out a gun and shoot it, shoot a person would have been not self-defense, right? So I remember when I watched the video, I, I was thinking that too. And it wasn't clear to me if the moose had really disengaged, but let, the, the video is only a minute long. So let me pull it up and we can watch it again. All right, here we go. Whoops. Got to click here. See, this is territoriality too. This this animal is in a territory. You're the one encroaching on the moose there, right? He moved up. So the, the moose is approaching, charges a little bit. The guy scares him off, and then the moose whoa, comes whoa, back. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hoofs up. Whoa, 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 whoa. See, he already scared it away once, and then it charged whoa, whoa, him again. Whoa, 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 so it's not like you know he scared hey, away. Hey, 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 hey. Is the moose the moose is coming back towards him now when he's firing those shots? So, I mean, can you argue about the last shot or the second and last shot when the moose is falling over on its side? Maybe See, it looks like kind of constrained but... terrain. Yeah, you know, he wasn't in this open area here, right? He was in the trees. Interesting. Yeah, well, see, and this is the kind of fact scenario that gets real muddy. And people do. We look at this through a self, I look at this as a self defense lens when in fact what you're saying is it's interesting because it is you're right it's a necessity defense or a duress defense not a self-defense interesting it's, it's fascinating how that works in the brain right 
So the jury would have to decide. This guy basically would be telling his story to the jury. Uh, listen, I, I know it's normally wrong to shoot a moose, you know, whatever the crime might be, cruelty to animals, poaching. I mean, who knows? I, I don't know what use of force against animal crimes really are, but it would be some kind of criminal offense. But I was justified in doing it under necessity because I was avoiding a greater harm, right? Death or serious bodily injury to myself. And the jury would have to decide, well, has he convinced us by 51% of the evidence? If he has, well, then we're obliged to acquit. If he hasn't, then he's guilty of whatever that underlying offense might be. By the way, one thing I should point out here, most of the time these cases don't come up in the woods like this. When they come up, in my experience, it's usually in human settings in communities and people are using the gun against a dog. Typically there's an aggressive dog or a dog they claim to be aggressive and it's in a community where people live. And what often happens is they're not charged simply with cruelty to animals for having shot the dog or shot at the dog. They're charged with that. And then they're also charged with felony reckless endangerment for the danger they created to the community by sending rounds flying around the community. And that's a serious charge. Uh, you know, that's not going to be some misdemeanor where you pay a fine or you're worried about spending a month in the, in the county jail. Uh, that's that's real prison time if you're convicted. Uh, and it could be a lot of counts. Uh, and you use the gun, which could be an aggravating factor in terms of sentencing. Um, so here they I would they probably avoid that risk because it looks like they're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but if it's in a, a normal HOA type community and you start discharging a gun, you better have a damn good reason because you're not just defending yourself under necessity now. You're also creating a risk of death or serious bodily injury to all the innocent people who live in that community. Well, it's something another interesting um, take here or it's kind of thinking about it is where is this occurring? You know, if you're somebody who is in the in the woods, if you're a rural living kind of person and you're dealing with animals a lot, you're much more upfront and much closer hunters, people that live in rural areas. And sometimes these things, if especially if it's federalized, but you might get a big city jurisdiction, you know, if you've got a county charge and all in your jury pool is coming from large population centers that maybe don't have the same interaction. So the way a city person would view this might be very different from the way a rural person would view this and your jury might be made up of those city folk. I, I'd be very concerned about that as a defense attorney about where my jury pool is coming from on this type of case. Yeah, no, it can be a real risk. I see here. So I live in a community in Colorado that's that's basically new. So 10 years ago, there was nothing here. Now there's a giant HOA here. So everyone's just moved here to live in the HOA. Uh, but we still have a lot of wild critters. In fact, we had, a, we had a bear on my street just a couple of weeks ago. I ro rode my motorcycle up the street, coming home from uh, jujitsu, and there was a bear right there walking up the sidewalk. Um, but all the people who live here are like city folks. And as far as they're concerned, this is that bear's territory. And we're all intruders on the bear's territory. And anything that bear wants to do is fine with them. Well, if you shoot that bear you better have a damn good reason because all the people who are going to be sitting on your jury are those people who think you're inherently the intruder in the bear's territory. So you're automatically wrong uh, for whatever you might have done to that bear. Right. So. Yeah. Well, jury pools are important. And, uh, and like you say, people humanize these animals and they're, my, my son actually had a new, he was telling me about his first assignment in English class at college. He has got a new English class and he was, he was going to write about the time we encountered a bear. We were in the, we were vacationing in the hills of Tennessee in the Smoky mountains in a cabin. And this bear came to our door. We were cooking fish inside. And it, I mean, it was a big bear and it put its muzzle into the, one of these, like a hole that would like a vent, put its nose into the vent and took a sniff. And when you heard that bear sniff and take in a big lung full of air, I mean, it must've been a 500 pound bear. It's, it's a huge dangerous animal and you're thinking this thing is out in the woods and and my son said monsters exist this isn't just some you know cute little animal that we bring the teddy bear and show the child this is a monster that will kill you in the woods and i think that people that live next to these wild animals have a much better perspective than do the city folk who watch television screens for a living and go from cubicle to cubicle right I mean, and, but you don't know, I mean, there, there's different brains at work here and I would like to get 
if I was representing this guy, I'd had him charged. I definitely want to have some expertise from the woodsman about the dangers of this animal. Um, in fact, if it's charged, it's a wildlife officer or something. You could probably elicit a lot of that from the state wildlife officers who are charging them. Well, tell me about the times that how dangerous these animals are. And you could turn that around. See, I'm thinking about defending this guy already. <laughs> now, let me pull up this, uh, the Italian video again. I'll just play the first part of it. It's very quick. Uh, three shots in quick succession. <clears throat> Let's see. Here we go. She's doing a good job defending herself on that one. Yeah. In a, in a lot of, in, and see, hogs are nuisance animals in a lot of states. Um, I know Texas, for one, Florida also, and I'm not sure what the hunting regulations are. Again, I, I it's not something I deal with regularly, but in some states, there's such nuisance animals that there is no hunting season for them. So yeah, it's I open season it's, all the time. Right. So it's a different deal when you're dealing with a, a wild hog like that, as opposed to a bear or some sort of endangered animal. Yeah. Um, you're going to have a much different statutory view of things. There's a cuteness factor too. And I, and I, well, hate they're not that, that cute in, in person. Human. So uh, anyone who's ever been around wild hogs, these wild boar, uh, these are dangerous, dangerous, dangerous animals. I mean, and they will they will maim you and kill you in an instant. Those tusks are no joke. They're large. This one wasn't that large, but they get big. They get hundreds of pounds, two, three hundred pounds. Uh, they'll take out a human being with no trouble at all. And and there's usually more than one. Um, so in close quarters, I mean, I've never been boar hunting. Might do it sometime. I get invitations from time to time. But the way I'd like to do it is with a rifle at a distance at night <laughs> with a night vision scope. Uh, from a position of safety. I'm not I'm not walking through brush, close brush like this with a three round shotgun uh looking for a wild board. This to yeah, me this why is do you need a ten round magazine conduct. anyway. What is this? Yeah. <laughs> no, I want a 30 round with uh with <laughs> right. lots of you know 300 blackout fat rounds in it. No, I that hog hunting is the only hunting that would really interest me because I understand they are nuisance animals. And I think that Texas has gotten real creative. They actually hunt them from helicopters. Have you seen those? Yeah, I have. I have. Yeah. They that charge that looks like they fun. charge you big bucks and you go do their fix their nuisance hog problem. Maybe I'll do that. I'll be in I'll be in Texas in a couple months actually for a, a podcast thing. Uh, Jeff Gonzalez, who's uh former Navy SEAL who does a lot of self-defense stuff. I think his website is AR15.com, but I'm going to be on his podcast in November. Uh, in Texas, in Austin, you have to be there in person, apparently, uh, to be on that podcast. So we'll see. Who knows? I think I'll be riding the motorcycle now for that trip. So someone would have to lend me a rifle. I wonder if they have any rifles to loan out in Texas. Probably. I could probably get a hold of one. All right, so let me take a look here and see if we have any uh, questions to address first from the Law of Self-Defense members. we got a, a bunch of people here. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, I should mention one of the Law of Self-Defense members did point me to a Washington State um, appellate court decision, um, mid-level appellate courts involving a gentleman who was uh, <laughs> driving drunk with his uh, girlfriend uh, his, his, um, and uh, decided he had to pee and stopped his car and, and was uh, purportedly attacked by a Doberman that he shot uh, with a gun in a crowded neighborhood and found himself facing all these kinds of charges we were just talking about, basically reckless endangerment. They called it a drive-by shooting, but that's just the way they phrase it there. Uh, animal cruelty, all kinds of stuff. And he, he tried to raise a self-defense argument, a defense of necessity argument. I didn't pull up the case here because I think it had a lot of bad reasoning and was very sloppy and w was so noisy. It would have been more effort than worth. But if anybody wants to read it in, uh, I want to, I always appreciate it when people send me cases, you can find it at law of slash hull, like the hull of a boat, H U L L. Um, and you can read it there if you like, it's an interesting case, just too complicated to get into in a podcast. Uh, so thank you, Donnie, for sending that to uh, bringing that to my attention. All right, let's see. Uh, tch, tch. Um, someone's asking a concealed carry permit question. Folks, I don't do gun law. I do use of force law. So uh, you have to go to a different source for your state-specific gun law questions. 
I know only as much gun law as I need to know to stay within the law myself. As I What's the concealed carry question? Is it legal for my husband to conceal carry a pistol that's registered to me? So there's a gun registration question and layered upon a concealed carry question, and they don't even say what state they're in. And there's so, a lot of there's a state. It's a state question, and there's oh, also not, a not, lot of and hidden later facts she adds there. that she's in Maryland. So there's a lot of hidden if, facts there that need to be asked before the answer right. can be made. Why doesn't he have a concealed weapons permit? Yeah, and Maryland. I mean, that's one of the hardcore gun control states, uh, especially when it comes to carry. So. So I'll just leave that be. So no questions really from the membership there. Let me pull up my, uh, open up my super chat window, see if there's anything that needs to be addressed there. Supers. Uh, just one $5 super chat. Thank you very much from switch 1947. Whoops, that's the wrong one. That's my applause. Uh, Jeff Griffith, platinum member. Thank you very much for being a platinum member. Always appreciated. Um, an old incident. Please comment on the FBI sniper shooting Vicky Weaver in Ruby Ridge. Uh, maybe I'll do a show on that. That's that's kind of history at this point, folks. Well, uh, FBI behavior is not history. It yeah. kind of is a history of bad FBI behavior. Um, the more that comes about this Mar-a-Lago warrant, um, the more that those things get remembered. Yeah, that's right. And of course, it's it's not just it's not just Ruby Ridge. It's Waco. It's a whole series of uh, you know a lot of catastrophically bad decision making with very 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 bad consequences for the people involved, the victims involved. Uh, unfortunately, um, I'd also refer people if they're interested in this topic. I know we we I came on to the last video that you did on animals. I've dealt with enough animal cases that, and I think we had a really good discussion, sort of talking about the whole pet scenario and. And uh, there was a different angle. This is this is more of a hunting scenario. So if people are interested in that, I'd refer them back to the um, the video that we did. I think it was the last time I was on. Actually, it was on uh, about animals and defending yourself against animals in a pet, like a, somebody's pet. Because when you're dealing with somebody's pet, there's a human behind it, and all of a sudden it's like you shot my dog, you know, and then all you yep. escalated something. Right. So. Um, I would refer people back to that. And I really hope that people, if anybody's interested and signs up on, um, I'd love to have you in our class. And I know that it's going to be a lot of fun. And so I just want to plug that one yeah. more time. Let it's me, one of the reasons I want to come up on again. Today. Let me pull that up again. So Steve is the instructor, attorney Steve Gosney, for our American law course on criminal law, which starts tomorrow. Tomorrow's the first class, tomorrow evening. That's Wednesday, September 7th. Uh, and until that course starts, you can register folks for half price. That saves you hundreds of dollars. That's through the start of the class tomorrow. Uh, teaching criminal law in the traditional criminal law, in the traditional American way, much less expensively, much less expensively, uh, both in terms of time and money than law school and without any of the political ideology that plagues law schools today. Um, it's taught on a semester long basis, just like law school, very much a law school type experience, folks. That's how we've modeled this uh, taught live. Steve is teaching it live. If you happen to miss one of the live classes, you will have the recording of the class available to you. But the class will be taught live every week, every Wednesday evening. And um, Steve, do you want to add more? Well, just um, it was it's a it's a pleasure. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm, I get as much out of these things as teaching. I love teaching because I love helping people out. And uh, I'm really interested to hear kind of the expertise from your group, because I know there's going to be different people. Like you said, there might there's going to be a lawyer there. I hear there's going to be some self-defense instructors in the course. And For so sure. there will be some interaction. There will be I mean, there'll be a lot of interaction, I hope. But question and answer points between that I've laid out on each course. And uh, a lot of this is stuff that it's basically what I teach our, our people here. I mean, you know, our trial team and our appellate team. And also, it, it's a lot of it's drawn from, I mean, the years of education. I, I'm a glutton for continuing ed. And so I go to capital trainings. And actually, I'm one of the few lawyers in Florida that's actually had the capital training as a prosecutor and a capital training as a defense attorney, because I was in line to be capital trial prosecutor and took the class, but never did it. Um, and then, so, so I was trained to be a capital prosecutor and those two sides, let me tell you, do not see eye to eye, <laughs> yeah. 
but uh, it's well, neat because I can draw on both those sources to kind of educate you on the sides, the, the question about the death penalty, murders, which a lot of people are interested in. So we'll spend a lot of time on that stuff. Yeah, that's one of the, the particularly great things I love about having you teach this criminal law class is your experience on both the prosecution and the defense side of the table. I've never been on the prosecution side of the table, so I have an admittedly biased perspective on all these issues, you know, favorable to the defense, of course. Uh, so having someone who's got years of professional experience on both sides of the uh, courtroom is uh, simply invaluable. And folks, you can learn about all this at lawselfdefense.com slash lawcourses. Um, by the way, if you go there to lawofselfdefense.com slash lawcourses, I have a series of four short videos that kind of explains our, our, our vision for all these courses, including this criminal law course, why we think it's important for all American patriots to be well-informed, expertly informed on the law. If you don't know the law, folks, it can and will be used against you in real life. So make sure you arm your mind by learning the law and our vision for all of this is to enable you to do that at an expert level as inexpensively and as conveniently as possible. And you can learn more about that and take advantage of the 50% off tuition, folks, for this criminal law class starting tomorrow evening at lawofselfdefense.com slash law courses. All right, folks, I think that's all we have for today at this point. Steve, thank you very much for joining us again. Um, for everybody out there, just remember, as always, if you carry a gun so you're hard to kill, that's why I carry a gun so I'm hard to kill, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law, which, by the way, you can learn at lawselfdefense.com slash lawcourses. Know the law so you're hard to convict. Until next time, hopefully tomorrow evening in the criminal law class. Until next time, uh, thank you, Steve Gosney, again for joining us. And I remain attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you.